Hey everyone, my name is Peter Brandt. I'm an ANSYS application engineer for Leap Australia. And today I want to show you the new NVH toolkit in ANSYS Mechanical 2022 R1. Now, if you have any questions after this session, uh, feel free to send me an email, peter.brandt at leapos.com.au. Also, if you want to connect to me uh, at LinkedIn, that's, uh, that's good. I'll start with a um, bit of an explanation what this new NVH toolkit does, and then I'll show you a quick uh, live demo as well. Now, the whole idea of the NVH toolkit is it's if you do modal testing, and you, so you do a lot of experimental testing, and then you use ANSYS as well, you probably want to correlate your ANSYS model with your modal testing, because after you have correlated it, you have the confidence in your model, you can start using it for more advanced dynamic analysis, like harmonic analysis, transient, random vibration, and uh, things like that. So the first step is correlate your FE model, which always has lots of unknowns, with your test data. And the way to do that is through the modal assurance criterion. So you do a modal analysis in ANSYS first, and then you import a universal file, a UMV file, uh, from your test data that has the modal content from the test data. Now, most test programs, they can output that UMV file. It's a simple ASCII file. You can then import that into ANSYS, and that allows you then to start comparing those modes based on that modal assurance criteria. Now, that MAC criteria, what it is, it's pretty simply a scalar, explained here on the bottom right, a scalar between 0 and 1. So you take a mode shape, an eigenvector of your experimental mode, and then you, 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 you take the product with an eigenvector of the ANSYS mode, you normalize that, that gives you a value between 0 and 1. Now, if that value is close to 0, it means that the two modes correlate really poorly. If the value is close to 1, the modes uh, match very well and they correlate really well. So what you typically can do then is you can create this matrix where you compare all the modes from the test data with all the modes from the ANSYS data and then typically you will see good correlation on the diagonal and then bad correlation elsewhere. Now, the tool also allows you then to display uh, animations of both the ANSYS mode and the test mode next to each other, which gives you a nice comparison again. Also, um, when you import your UMV file, it may not be at the right position. So the tool also allows you to do coordinate transformations uh, or an alignment through nodal alignment or use local coordinate systems or just rigid body transformations in general, basically to position the UMV file close to the ANSYS file uh, in order to do that, uh, that matching. And the matching is done automatically by ANSYS. It has lots of tools to uh, do nodal pairing, modal pairing, and uh, basically uh, filter out which modes uh, identify with each other. And it calculates then the MAC criteria. Also, when you have cyclic symmetric tools, um, it has special options for cyclic optimization. Now, let's have a quick look at a simple model for a demonstration. So, you start with a modal analysis in ANSYS, and when you want to use this NVH toolkit, you have to go to the extensions, manage extensions, and enable it. So, in ANSYS 20, uh, 22R1, uh, the NVH toolkit is actually built in inside ANSYS Workbench, so not as an uh, ACT as it was before. It's actually built inside Workbench. You just have to activate it here through the Manage Extensions. And once you do that, and you open the mechanical model, you will see an NVH toolkit here as an additional menu that you can use in combination with your modal results. So the first option here is the MAC calculator. We'll show you that in the solution output of the model. The second option is a result recovery. Now, I'm not going to show you that here, but the whole idea is that, you know, when you do a modal analysis in ANSYS, you're not defining any loads. Uh, you basically calculate frequencies and mode shapes based on stiffness and mass of the model. But these, uh, these results, these modes are then normalized, mass normalized, for visualization, because there are no loads in the model, so you don't really know what the, the real magnitude is, is quite arbitrary. However, if you have your test data, you actually have 
the, the real displacement from the test data. So you can then reverse engineer the stresses and strains in your ANSYS model based on the displacements in your test data. So that's the idea of that stress uh, results recovery tool. It's a kind of reverse engineering to predict stresses and strains for your ANSYS model, even if there's no loads in this model. You just use your displacement from the test data. But as I said, I will concentrate on the MAC calculator. So here I've got a really simple model of, of a disk. Uh, it's a bit uh, thicker at the edge here. Now, there's no constraints in this model. So when you do a modal analysis, the first six frequencies are basically uh, rigid body modes, uh, as expected. And the first real uh, structural frequency is number seven. It's a frequency of 435 hertz, and it's this uh, bending mode, double bending mode here. And then, of course, uh, the high order frequencies uh, yeah, are displayed here as well. So basically, we've calculated the first 20 frequencies in the model, where the first six are rigid body modes. Now, let's assume that we had some test data, and we uh, uh, used the MAC calculator here to pick up a UNV file. Now, as I mentioned, these UNV files, they are simple ASCII files with a certain format, and you can export them from most um, you know, measurement programs. And once you have them, you can select them here, pick them up. You can then put them in the right location, as I said before. Um, maybe it needs a rich body transformation or some new orientation. Uh, in fact, as you can see here, there's a bit of a distance in z-direction. So I can do an, a rigid body transformation here. Um, actually, let's do an um, orient by a rigid body transformation. Now I know that that one was one millimeter in that direction. Yeah, so now you see that they are aligned. If you need to rotate them as well, you, you can use transformations here. So the red lines are basically the trace lines from your test data. Okay, some other things you can see here. Um, on the left, we see the frequencies in the ANSYS model, including the rich body modes. On the right, we see the frequencies from our test data. Now, they are slightly different. There's not a um, fantastic matching, but we can still compare them. So if we don't do anything else and just use the defaults here, then Let's see what it gives us here. We click on the Mac calculator and we click on the table here. This is the output. And we see here this, this matrix, as mentioned before, where on the vertical axis we have the frequencies from our ANSYS model and on the horizontal axis the frequency from the test data, the UNV file. And then every field here is basically a matching that value, that MAC value between 0 and 1, between the ANSYS mode and the test mode. So for instance here, the first one, the correlation between the rigid body mode and the test mode is nearly 0, as expected. So when I click that field here, double click it, it actually displays the modes corresponding to that field. And then you can play it and show them side by side. So clearly there's very poor correlation here. Let's have a look at this mode here. This one has a quite a good correlation, 0 0.98. So if I double click it, I get mode 435 in my ANSYS model. Uh, let's not show the mesh here, maybe a bit easier. And you can see that that one matches mode um, 372 hertz in the test data a lot better. I mean, clearly the resolution is different. Uh, first we have a circle here and here a square. And of course, the re resolution in the finite element model is different, but you can see it's the same mode here. Now, you can also scale the, um, the deformation, or if they're out of phase, you can make that minus one. And uh, anyway, you can scale those modes for better visualization. But this matrix here is not exactly useful in the sense that a lot of these modes are not matching well at all. It's only the modes where these fields um, are red or close to or red or orange, close to one anyway. So there's a few more options here that we can use. 
we can, for example, pair the modes. So if we use that and we click on pair, it will actually try now to pick up the mode where the Mac limit is large in 0.9. So we generate that one. Uh, in this case, it tries to pair them, but as you can see, there's only two modes that actually match here based on that Mac criteria larger than 0.9. Now the matching is pretty good, 0.944 for the first one. So it's this mode here, as you can see, they are very similar modes, except they're out of phase. So make that zoom one again. You see, this is the same mode. The first one, the 707 hertz ANSYS. The other one, 711 hertz test data. Very good correlation. And the second one, this one here, also very good correlation, um, 0 0.93. Okay, but if you want more modes, of course, we can change that MAC limit. So let's say if I make it 0.5 and generate it again. It will probably pick up a few more modes uh, and yeah so now you can see this one here matches well this one here matches well this one here 0.818 matches but not perfectly and again it's because of the, the resolution here the ANSYS model has a high order mode that cannot be picked up very well in the test data although the frequencies are very similar around the 3000 yeah, 50 hertz so very similar modes again so that's how it works. But then where it really becomes interesting is when you start matching the test data with the ANSYS data in an automatic way. So you can actually use design of experiments and do parametric optimization by making that a parameter. So the objective function now is an output parameter and then we can, for example, use geometry, thicknesses, uh, dimensions, uh, etc. to um, optimize this model and I've actually given made a small model here so here for instance I have created a parametric model where I made input parameters for my Young's models my density and then uh, I had some output parameters for the outer radius sorry an another input parameter for my geometry the outer radius of the disk the thickness inner radius and then the output parameter was that Mac calculator so once you use that you can then let ANSYS automatically set up a design space and it does that all automatically so it creates a small variation for all the input parameters so if you click on one of them you see there's automatic uh, continuous variation and then it sets up this design space and clearly it does that in a really clever way it uses an algorithm for that in this case a central composite design because of course if I have five input parameters as an example and you have five changes for each of them, I would have five to the power of five runs, which is a lot. But by using ANSYS design experiments, it will use a subset of runs, in this case only 28, and it will optimize the design space so that I get as much independent information uh, as possible. And then you can use that information after I've done all these runs, you can create then your typical response services, and the response service is effectively a mathematical uh, fit, like it's basically a spline in the n-dimensional space between the, the output points and the input points of your uh, design of experiments. So it's just basically a mathematical type of uh, fitting. Again, special algorithm here. But the beauty is once you have that response service, you can then use it to do optimization because you can immediately then find the minimum uh, in, a, in a global space. So here, for instance, I've set out the MAC calculator versus the thickness on the x-axis and the outer radius on the y-axis. And you see that that minimum MAC calculator, and that's basically the error that you're looking at. You want to minimize that as your objective. And you, yeah, then you, you find this point over here. In this case, we can just visually see what's going on but you can also do that more precisely with an optimization um, where you let ANSYS do that calculation for you uh, and, it, and it finds then the optimum candidate to use, uh, basically, uh, yeah, tune all your input variables so that your objective function becomes the smallest possible. And the objective function, I actually forgot to say that, 
is basically uh, like a regression function where you use um, the minimum error between the sum of squares of your uh, frequencies uh, of the ANSYS model minus the frequencies of the test data. And then you take the sum of that, square it, minimize that. Um, you can then combine that as well with the MAC criteria. And in fact, there's this value alpha here, which gives you an indication how much contribution the frequencies have and how much contribution the MAC criteria has. Anyway, you can find that in the help, how that all works. Um, that gives you an option to optimize your design. And also it shows you immediately the sensitivity. So this is also useful information. It tells you the sensitivity of my input variables on my objective function, which is always very useful because you have a lot of variables here. It tells me, for instance, that my, which one is this, my outer radius is much uh, better variable to optimize than, for example, the density. Okay, so it tells you which variables to focus on uh, for fine-tuning your model. All right, well, that concludes my presentation. If you have any more questions, um, feel free to send me an email at peter.brand at leapos.com.au. Thank you very much uh, for your attention.